week four of our study of the book of Job here at uh, St. Thomas Episcopal Church. Um, week four, that means we're ready for chapter four, and as you can see from the slide, we're going to work our way all the way through chapter 14. It's going to cover the um, <clears throat> interchange, the, the interchange that, that Job and his three friends have this evening. They're going to have three of these, but this is going to get us all the way through the, uh, the first of these. We're going to need every spare minute tonight, so I'm not even going to bother with a review other than to say we talked about Job in the previous <laughs> times that we were together. <clears throat> so with that, um, let's pray. Dear Lord and Father of all human beings, Jesus said that he, like you, would never leave us or forsake us or abandon us as orphans. Forgive us then for putting it this boldly, but it often feels like you're not helping us at all. Life's hard and plans go awry. Things happen and, and almost before we know it, we're staring at the end of life. Don't forget that from time to time we could use some reassurance as we commit our way to you and depend on you and seek to follow you for Jesus' sake. Well, Stephen is going to start us off again this evening with uh, uh, some Bach. Some Bach, yes. Uh, just a quick word or two. This is another Aleman, one of those French dances. And this is from the first suite. It's like the other one I did last time, divided into two sections, each of which is repeated. This first suite in particular uh, is kind of an answer, box answer in around 1720 to perhaps the question, what can a cello do really? Because prior to this, I'm really generalizing, but prior to this, the cello had been pretty much uh, a bass instrument that just played along kind of the bass lines of whatever it was that was going on. And um, Bach here is exploring not the absolute complete range of the instrument, but quite a lot of it. And that's part of the reason there are a lot of broken chords and things like that, because essentially we're a one note instrument here. And um, to imply harmony and melody and all that all at once was quite a task that uh, Bach was obviously up to. But having said that, that may account for Part of the reason that sometimes these things are a little obscure to uh, listen. Um, this particular argument, I think, is almost all melody. It's just in and out, very contemplative sort of tune. <laughs>
harmony and concord in that than we're going to hear the rest of it. <laughs> All right, here's the three friends that uh, Job is going to begin interacting with um, vocally to see the Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far. Temanite, the Shuite, and the Maavitite. Um, after listening to um, Job's, really his unrelieved pain that just kind of gushed out of him, uh, last week. His friends respond. Now, now they're just shocked as can be. We don't really know what their relationship was to him. We can sort of assume that it was potentially a business associate of some kind, but whatever it was, they respond and, and they're just shocked. But then when they respond, Job consistently rejects almost everything that they say. There are some things that he agrees with them on, but for the most part, uh, he just rejects their words. Um, we're going to find, if you if you paid attention to the length of the chapters and so on, this is just one of those intriguing things. Job's speeches are always longer than those of his friends. His friends keep getting consistently shorter. 
That doesn't necessarily mean that Job's speeches will be shorter, but they will consistently always be longer than those of, of the friends. Uh, and with each one of these speeches that we're going to hear, beginning with Eliphaz's, uh, right off the bat this evening, we're effectively hearing some kind of historic response to the fact of suffering. And it is most likely wrong. <laughs> or at least it's going to have wrong aspects in it. Um, at a general level, everything that we're going to hear these guys say is, by and large, perfectly fine. To a degree. What makes it totally wrong is their application of it to Job in this particular situation. It's like if you know one thing and you make every situation that you encounter fit that one thing that you know. It's like, you know, the guy who had a hammer and so everything he found was a nail. It just doesn't work and it, and it doesn't work for them in this particular situation either. Okay, Eliphaz is a Timonite. We don't know really where that is, but there's an assumption that is made, and here's the basis of the assumption. Eliphaz is the name in the book of Genesis of the oldest son of Esau, the brother of Jacob. Esau lives in Edom. That's the area that is sort of south and a little east of Canaan, Palestine, Israel, uh, Judah. Uh, it's the part of, of the land that is beneath the Dead Sea and slightly to the east. It's where King Herod is going to come from, although by that time it's not called Edom, it's called Idumea. Uh, that's free. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, that's where Esau tended to live. And Esau's son's name is Eliphaz, not to be mistaken for this guy. And his grandson, the son of Eliphaz, is Timon. So to put it all together, and biblical scholars say, aha, we know where Teman is. It's in Edom, and that's where Eliphaz was from. We don't know. But that's, that's how they came up with it. So enough of that, and on to uh, what we were reading for this evening. Incidentally, Patty started speed reading. Uh, sorry, you're, <laughs> she, she started speed reading about the time I left to come tonight and said, I gotta get this in before we show up tonight. And I just kind of shook my head at her. She said, don't give me that. You're gonna have to make sense of it for me anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so Eliphaz, uh, shocked at what he hears Job say, begins to respond. We can sort of assume since he's the first speaker, he's probably the oldest of the three. Again, it's an assumption, but it's probably a, a decent one. And, and he starts off by really offering a, a, a true word of consolation uh, to Job. He's disturbed by Job's cursing and complaining and lamenting in, in chapter 3, and, and, you know, rightly so. We were a bit concerned and frustrated last week as well when we heard it. But what he does is he, he starts off by praising um, Job's piety in these, for open, in these opening uh, verses. And there's four specific ways in which uh, he notes that, that Job has been so good at displaying his piety, and you can read those. Um, and, but he suggests then that religious belief, our piety, the good deeds that we do, ought to be able to sustain us when times turn bad. Argument there, I mean, that's just, that's a good thing to think. Um, but obviously it hasn't done that for Job. And so offering, having offered these words of consolation, Eliphaz then continues. And he, as he begins to say what he really thinks he needs to say, he starts talking about the doctrine of retribution. And in a nutshell, what that means is that, that when you do good, God rewards you. But when you do bad, God punishes you. Now, we may not say those things quite that baldly, but if we're honest, probably at least at some level, we tend to think that too. You keep that up, God's going to bonk you, is a version of that particular idea. Um, it doesn't mean that 
that the righteous can't sometimes experience setbacks in life. I mean, things happen. But what it means is that, that if you're righteous, the setback is only going to be temporary. Life will get back on an even keel for you. Whereas conversely, if you're an evil person or somebody who's engaged in doing things that are inappropriate on a regular basis, you may get away with it for a while. But sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. Uh, God is going to lower the limit. That's the doctrine of retribution. And that's what he shares. It's, it's not like Job shouldn't have already known this. He did know. But that's where Eliphaz uh, begins to talk with him. Now, at a general level again, probably we would have to say that while we have been guilty of saying that very thing, that really doesn't comport with our own experience, does it? Just because you're righteous doesn't mean that everything ends up on an even, even keel for you any more than if you were a non-righteous person that you eventually get your comeuppance. There's too many examples of the alternatives of those for us really to be able to buy into this fully. So then, the core of this particular talk that he uh, shares with Job is found then in chapter 4, verses 12 through 21. It's a report of a, of a vision that he had. Now, it's a disturbing vision. He wasn't looking for this. It comes to him, and, and it really shakes him up deeply. But the core of this vision is that human beings are at their innermost core. They are incapable of ever really being just, much less pure. We've just got too much evil in us to be able to really be ultimately good. We're just problem creatures. Uh, and so from time to time, bottom line, we all suffer, which we do. Now there's a verse, um, verse 17, that in the King James Version said, shall humans claim to be more just than God? And that has given rise to all kinds of interesting uh, ideologies and religious thoughts, but since that's really not what it says, I'll just leave it alone for now, but if you have used that line, um, stop, <laughs> because that's, that's not what it says. Okay, in chapter 5, as he continues to speak, on the basis of this vision that he has now shared with Job that, that people are not really finally just, um, he starts talking about the fact that, that human beings don't really have anybody to intercede for us. Now, of course, this is before Christ, so we'd have a different perspective on that today. But in his own time, there is no such thing as a mediator for human beings to help uh, us do better than, than we are. You may think that's a strange thing for him to say, but he uses it to be able to declare to Job that you're wasting your time in your lament that you gave in chapter 3. You're wasting your time trying to hope that somebody might come to your rescue. There is nobody to come to your rescue, Job. You just need, and this is where he's going to head very quickly, if you want to get past your suffering, you need to quit sinning. It is that simple. Stop. If you stop, then God will begin to remove the suffering and fill you once again up with the blessing. But since that's where you're at, all this cursing and so on, he says only fools uh, would actually give voice to such harsh words as, as you did. And you know, we may have felt the same thing last week, uh, listening to Job. Um, any prosperity they enjoy is just, it's just fleeting, trouble is gonna catch up with them, and that's where you are, Job. That's why you're suffering right now. He then says to him, you know, if I were in your shoes, here's what I would do. Well, that's always helpful <laughs> advice to what to offer. Uh, instead of railing against all the retribution that you are experiencing correctly, I might add, he says, um, you should see the punishment that you are receiving as, in fact, of good. Because... God fires these warning shots over the prow of our life 
to get our attention and stop it. Now, Job is probably sitting there with all these running sores and everything else all over his body thinking, yeah, well, if God just fired shots over the prow of my life, he hissed a little low several times. Because I'm really suffering here. But nevertheless, that's what Eliphaz says to him. If you begin to heed these warning shots, then um, it's going to help you begin to restore your relationship with God. And then things are going to be okay. And, and he offers, and these are wonderful, in these verses he offers six particular benefits or forms of protection that God extends to those who actually heed his warning. And they, they run the gamut from food in the midst of a famine to, to a long life. Well, I mean, that's biblical, isn't it? Um, Elisha got food when he was hungry. The Ten Commandments say that if you honor your father and your mother, you will live long. He's just offering what we know from the pages of Scripture. Well, <clears throat> you know, he means well. <laughs> uh, and he's offering generally fairly sound advice uh, to Job. That no mortal is blameless. We're all periodically chastened in life. And your proper response really should be submission to God. Confess, repent. Um, and because God is merciful, then, you know, when you respond properly, then there's going to ultimately be lasting benefits that accrue to you. It sounds great. The trouble is, that's effectively the same thing that the Satan said way back in chapter 1 in regard to God. And so that if Job were to have accepted Eliphaz's advice, i.e., even though he has not sinned, that's very clear in chapter 1, that Eliphaz has not, I mean, that Job has not done anything deserving of this. But if he were to repent, as Eliphaz has suggested that he do, so that he could then once again receive the benefits that God offers, then he would effectively be tossing away his relationship with God for the benefits. Wow. This stuff's pretty complex, but that's, that's the problem in a nutshell here. Uh, and so it's not that he necessarily argues that through in his head, but he intuitively realizes this advice is bogus. I can't accept this. And so he then begins to respond. Uh, to Eliphaz. And the response is going to cover two chapters as well, two longer chapters. Um, and he'll begin, he always does this, he will begin to speak to whoever it is who has spoken to him. But within just a very short time, really he's addressing all three of the friends through that one person. And then somewhere about halfway through or so, he's going to turn his attention away from the friends and start talking to God. So he talks to the individual, to the friends, and then to God. It's that movement in all every single one of these speeches that, that Job gives. So he starts off by defending uh, all the things that he said back in chapter 3. His suffering is real. If you don't believe it, just look at it. And he gives this terrible description of himself there at the beginning of this chapter. And you're thinking, oh my goodness. Um, doctors and others have looked at these lines as well as others. And they've come up with at least 32 different ailments that uh, Job had. But again, you know, I mean, that's, that's about as bogus as everything else is. So don't, don't buy into me again. The problem is here, Job's got it pretty bad. Not bad enough that he thinks he's going to die. He doesn't know that God has said he can't die. But he's got it pretty good. And so he says, my suffering is very real here. In fact, it's so real that God is effectively using me for target practice. Uh, he's been firing all these poisonous darts at me, and this is why I am in the, in the shape that I am in. If God would just grant to me my wish, if God would just finally put an end to my suffering and kill me off, I could at least die in the knowledge that that." I died, in my own mind, blameless. But he just keeps me alive to keep tossing more of these darts at me, and it's just not fair. <clears throat> I 
I don't know if you read Calvin and Hobbes when it was still in the newspapers, but it's one of the most theologically sensitive uh, <laughs> comic strips that has ever been read. I know nothing about Bill Watterson, but Calvin and Hobbes is cool. <laughs> well, then he turns and begins to accuse his friends of a whole lot of problems as well. You guys have come here. Thank you for coming here and sharing with me this consolation over this last week. But you have begun acting treacherously uh, toward me. Instead of offering to me your friendship, you've become about as dependable as an intermittent stream. I haven't ever made any demands on you at all. So why are you treating me the way that, that you are? And verse 14 becomes key. You'll see the word kindness there in, in this particular verse. Circle that word. That's the Hebrew word hesed, covenant loyalty. It's the word that in the New Testament becomes agape love. That, that loyalty that you stand by with someone and you stand with them no matter what. To the day you die, you are loyal to them. And that's the way that a friend is with another friend the same way that God is with us and we are to be with one another. Um, but this is not how they are treating him. They're not treating him as a, as a friend. They, they're unloading on him. And, and you know, Eliphaz has just started. It's going to get a whole lot worse here. He then uses that very word that Eliphaz used just a bit earlier, the fear of God, what we would call piety. Um, Eliphaz was shocked that Job's piety didn't do a better job of stopping his mouth in chapter 3. Now Job says, I'm shocked that your piety doesn't commit you at a more deep level to me. Why are you setting aside your piety and, and attacking me uh, the way that, that you are? Well, as an aside, we can step back from all of that. This isn't really what Job is saying, but we can step back from it and realize how blind we often are to the very ways that we fail to uphold the principles <clears throat> that we talk about all the time, and yet talk about how everybody else is failing to keep those principles. That's what these two guys are going back and forth with each other about right here. And then at the end of that chapter, um, he requests their sympathy. I, I don't need to hear all the other stuff you're saying to me. I just need you to treat me like a friend. He doesn't try to define what that necessarily is supposed to mean, except that instead of accusing me of having done some kind of wrong, what I need for you to do is to help me figure out what is going on. Because I don't know, and I am beside myself because of it. Well, that leads Job into them beginning to speak um, to God. And so he turns from his friends and begins actually to address God in this, in this wonderful uh, lament. And here's where, again, he graphically describes the pain that he is, is suffering here in the opening part of, of chapter 7. I'm not going to go into a lot of that, but I want to point out that down in verses 7 through 10, he makes a, a petition here, and he describes his own life as a Breath. That's one of those wonderful words, too, that you probably ought to circle. Um, that's the word that in the book of Ecclesiastes is translated, especially in the King James Bible, as vanity. Vanity of vanities. A vanity is something that is a wisp, a piece of smoke, something that's here for a moment and immediately gone. And the reason it gets translated as vanity in English is because, well, you know, how many times have we stood at the vanity, staring at ourselves in the mirror, and the moment we turn away, we go, wait, because we've already forgotten, and we have to turn back to get another glimpse. It doesn't last. It's something that's momentary and gone, like a wisp of smoke. It's the name of um, Adam's second son, who was here and gone. Now, granted, it was because his brother killed him, but he was here and, and gone. Now, there's just a rough breathing mark, which in English becomes the letter H. It's added to that. Abel becomes Abel. But nevertheless, it is this breath that is here and, and gone. 
Job's life is like a breath. I mean, it's short anyway. Those of us when we were 20 might have thought life was you know, going to last a little while, but, but you know, except for maybe James here, most of the rest of us are well past the midpoint of life, and we're getting down to the ninth inning, and we realize that we've blinked a time or two, and life's about over. It's a breath, and it's, it's gone. Well, this is even worse than that now because of all the suffering that, that he's experiencing. And so he petitions for relief. And in this strange but yet beautiful version of, of Psalm chapter 8 where, you know, you remember the, the verses that talk about what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visit his sin. Well, in these verses, he does this riff on Psalm, on Psalm chapter 8. Now, I don't know the Psalm, but, but nevertheless, it is a riff on, on Psalm 8 in which He's not marveling at God's interest in human beings. He, he just can't begin to understand. He's irritated at God for taking such interest in him. My life ain't going to last very long anyway. Why don't you cut me some slack and quit treating me the way that you are treating me, God? He hasn't done anything to deserve this kind of punishment from God. And, and by the way, if you don't cut me some slack, if you keep treating me the way that you are, I'm not going to last much longer. And then you're really going to be in a pickle, God, because then I'm going to be gone. And one of these days, you're going to come looking for me, and I ain't going to be here. So, so stop it. His illness has gotten into the point where, you know, at last, in chapter 3, he's asking all kinds of questions. He doesn't understand. He's gotten to the point, he just wanted to die. It'd be better if I'd been stillborn and put immediately into the grave. Well, he's kind of past that now. It's it's gone it's gone into that pain endurance level where where now he's got lots of, of questions. Why are his friends not treating him with with covenant loyalty, with with agape love, and and why is God treating me with all of this excessive punishment? I don't get it. I didn't walk you through that. James, your turn. Nice. Well, to Vaughn's point, there is a lot to cover tonight. I just kept cutting my notes back and back further and further. Uh, so sadly, I won't have time to go off on too many tangents. But next week, I promise, I've already got a few tangents uh, scheduled. Uh, and so one thing tonight, I'm going to just kind of focus and follow add a few nuggets to what Vaughn's already said about the text. And when I read at Staples uh, last week, I kind of made myself a cheat sheet, and they said, oh, we can blow that up for you. So I'll actually just kind of pass around just to share with you. Part of that is because of the the, the part we're talking about right now as far as the, the friends piece. I think it's important. Uh, and I like how this uh, description described it as a, a cloud of unknowing as far as how the friends were kind of hitting on some nuggets of truth but they were seeing it a little bit differently. And, and also, one thing I was just gonna point out is during this uh, back and forth with his friends, you'll kind of see almost like an opening statement, a rebuttal, a rebuttal to the rebuttal. And this will be important uh, not only through the text, but through uh, what hopefully we'll do next week. One thing just to add in here, and, and Vaughn kind of already mentioned it, um, Eliphaz means God, is strength. Bildad, son of, son of contention. Uh, he's brutal and blunt, very crude uh, in his methodology, as we'll see next. Zophar means a sparrow. Uh, again, harsh tongue makes several insinuations of Job that you'll see. Uh, but, but to Vaughn's point, as we begin chapter 4, uh, according to rabbinic tradition, apparently based on the connection with Teman, which is in Edom, kind of Vaughn mentioned on that, which would be Esau, uh, you kind of look at that from a, a holistic perspective. And at this early point, Eliphaz still believes Job to be a righteous man, like Vaughn had commented on, in which case God must be disciplining him because of some kind of sin in his life. So he wants to just keep encouraging Job, submit to the chastening of the Lord. So his future will be even brighter than his past. Despite these good intentions, however, Eliphaz uh, his advice is misplaced, and while his sensitivity to Job's agony is sadly lacking, in the chapters that follow, we'll see Job becomes more defiant, challenging the very foundation 
of the worldview of his, friend, of his friends. Uh, their attacks on him become increasingly severe uh, since their only way to hold to the stability of the world as they know it is just a very black and white, God rewards the righteous, condemns the wicked. And again, if you think about it, there's you know a few people that will bring that up to Jesus many centuries later. Uh, and again, the more wild his words, uh, the more their case is proved in their own eyes. Uh, theologian uh, Thomas Barron writes, out of the rigid logical construction Eliphaz has made of God and the world, out of a secure life and a clear mental script, he proceeds to instruct. He refers to Eliphaz uh, here as a logician, a moralist with lofty ethic and orthodoxy of speech. So I think this is a great point to remember as you read through this opening dialogue. Uh, by the time we get to chapter 5, again, we see the chapter open with Eliphaz feeling like he has proven a major point in the previous chapter. So now Eliphaz challenges Job to find someone who can refute his argument or advocate for Job's case. And by the time we get to the end of chapter 5, uh, Hammer Khan is described, we see that Job is now assured that he will come to the grave in vigor like sheaves of grain in their season. Uh, a healthy, long, blessed life will be yours on the other side of this chastisement. Job, if only you could fly. Of this, Eliphaz is uh, absolutely certain. He keeps going on and on about it, as he states emphatically in verse 27. Uh, this is the wisdom of the generations. This is what we have learned by careful observation. And here is the great paradox of Job. On the one hand, if Eliphaz's words were true, Job should never have experienced such tragedies. Uh, since he had already been living an exemplary, righteous life, uh, the same could be said for a multitude of godly believers through the centuries who suffered horrific calamities and loss. On the other hand, uh, at the end of the book, Again, spoiler alert, uh, it works out okay for you. You're like, oh, you ruined it. But uh, again, keep this in mind like we were saying before. I think that's why Job resonates so much today. I think that's why, like we had talked about a uh, week before last, uh, Bill Murray, of all people, and a, a cast from Hollywood actually did a rendition where they reread through Job, uh, which I thought was just really interesting, just kind of conveying how that does touch to every generation. Again, I'm pretty much out of time, but if we just jump to chapter 7, uh, again, you see that they raise the question again of Job's sin. Uh, Job doesn't claim to be guiltless, but why should but why should he be selected for this special attack as a sinner? Uh, why should his life be a burden when he is not that kind of a sinner? And we can see Job a breaking down of his integrity, uh, and again, when a man's integrity, anybody's integrity is broken down, again, we become an easier and easier mark for Satan. And this is the, this happens obviously, we see this all the time. Uh, Satan has a chance to attack him because uh, the more his integrity breaks down, the weaker he gets. And so the question becomes, will Job break under all of this? We shall see. So next in the lineup is Bildad in, in chapter eight. Bildad the Shuite. Uh, and no, I'm not going to repeat your joke because ago, although it was pretty good. Shua is the sixth son of Abraham, to which you may say, wait a minute, he had one son, Isaac, if you don't count the one he had just before Isaac. Well, after Sarah's death, he remarries and has a whole slew of kids, and they go all over the place. And Shua, the sixth of his sons, uh, that he has with Keturah, Abraham's second wife, uh, ends up somewhere out on the middle of Euphrates River. And because of the name Shua, scholars jump to the conclusion that that's where Bildad, as the Shuite, lived. It's as good as anything, but we haven't got a clue as to whether there's any validity to that thought or not. Well, here's what Bildad uh, says. He's, he's listened to Job, he's listened to Eliphaz, he's listened to Job's response to Eliphaz, and he comes out bristling and says, contrary to what you've just been implying, Job, God's ways are just. God is righteous, and God does righteous things. He does not treat people wrongly. 
the contemporary version of that is we say God is love and he doesn't do anything that is not to you loving. Doc, let's put an email somewhere and see where that ends. So he starts off by condemning Job for the terrible things that he thinks he has been saying. And he, and he essentially is not nice about this at all. Um, James said that he's blunt, and he certainly is. Uh, he, he says that Job's wordy complaints that he has been making, chapters 3, 6, 7, um, against an, an unjust God are absolutely inappropriate and they are certainly uncalled for. And then in what is really just kind of a low blow, in verse 4, he even goes to the point of saying, you know, if your kids hadn't been such sinners, they wouldn't have gotten killed. Well, ouch. Um, I can only imagine what Job is thinking at that point. And then he goes on to say, of course, you're still alive, so you're not nearly as bad of a sinner as your kids were. Well, I'm not sure that that helped Job at any level, but that's what, that's what Bildad says in, in these verses. And that's just the opening lines of, of Bildad to Job. In verses 5 through 7, he then offers an exhortation to him that what Job really needs to do at this point in his life, and this is a bit of a regurgitation of what Eliphaz said, you just need to seek God. Instead of expecting God to seek you, you need to seek God. And if you will do that, then things will begin to, to turn out okay. Um, if you expect, however, God to just set aside your anguish, you are sadly uh, mistaken. God will only set aside your anguish when you decide finally to set aside your sin. When you do that, God will then respond. And that incidentally is one of the ideas about salvation that the church has really messed up big time over the years. We don't do an awful lot of talking about sanctification in church anymore these days or holiness but but in those that do they will you progress from being a sinner into salvation just god justifies you and then you move on into holiness or you become sanctified well there are many churches that expect you to clean up your act and then you become acceptable it's like you've got to get sanctified before you can get justified well it doesn't work that way and so many of us, when we are justified, when, when we are in a save, saving relationship with God, there's still all kinds of crap in our lives that takes us potentially the rest of our lives to finally note, work on, and eliminate. And, and so we just have to recognize that. We can't expect everybody to be perfect from the moment God begins a work inside of him. It just doesn't work that way. But that's, that's what Bildad says here to, to Job. If you do that, then God will begin to respond to you with grace and with healing, and it's all going to be okay. The blessings that you receive on this side of your suffering will be so wonderful that it will make all of the blessings that you used to receive seem trivial. Well, okay, great. Uh, health and wealth <laughs> gospel right there. It sounds, it sounds wonderful. <clears throat> he then offers several pieces of evidence to back up his, his words uh, to Job. And here we discover that really where Bildad is coming from is tradition. Um, Eliphaz spoke on the basis of that vision that he had received inspiration if you if you will bildad speaks from tradition which is a good thing um, but it can go too far and he takes it too far he essentially tells job as if job doesn't know this already that the true wisdom true wisdom resides in the accumulated evidence of all those who have preceded us we cannot hope 
across the basis of our very short lives and very limited experiences to ever have a real good grasp of much of anything in life. For us to really get it, we've got to pay some attention to the accumulated evidence of those who have preceded us. And that's tradition. Uh, and he's exactly right, I would say, um, in, in that particular idea. He said the only thing that's really stopping us from, from receiving the benefit of the traditions that have preceded us is that we're too sophisticated and arrogant to stop and listen to our elders. But if we would stop and listen, it would be of great benefit to us always. And then he offers three illustrations from nature to make his point. And I won't go into those, but he speaks of, of papyrus, he speaks of uh, spider webs, and he speaks of uprooted plants. And in all three cases, and this is where he's driving, in all three cases, um, they tend to wither and rot very quickly. You can't depend on them. Um, sinners can't win, Joe. Stop sinning. Uh, it is, you are eventually going to crash and burn just like papyrus that is uprooted from a marsh, just like a spider's web can't hold you up, just like an uprooted plant. Even if you try to move it somewhere else, it's going to wither very quickly. You need to stop sinning. Well, uh, then his conclusion um, in the last couple of verses of, of chapter 8, he reiterates that God doesn't hurt righteous people, nor does God help unrighteous people. If you once again become righteous, you will be vindicated by God. You'll be okay. And when that happens, your enemies will then be shamed on the basis of how they treated you. But only if you do that, Job. So he once again is assuming that Job has done something or some groups of things of a very inappropriate kind to land him in this terrible situation that he is now facing. So Job responds to Gilgal. He starts off by um, talking about how he wishes he could just get an audience with God. If I could just talk to God about this, um, then we could work this out. He takes for granted that Bill Dad is correct, that, that God is just. It's a true statement. We would believe that too. We can't take fault with Bill Dad at that level. God, God is just. Uh, and he does righteous things. But Job also knows that he is blameless. He hasn't done anything. And we as the readers of the book of Job know that that's true. He's not done anything to deserve any of us. So God has not meted out onto him punishment because of some ill or wrong that he has done. Well, those two rock-solid beliefs are doing this in, in Job's brain, causing him to ask the question, but, but what if God is wrong? What if God is thinking wrong? What if God actually does act wrong? Because what other option is there? God is just but I haven't done anything to deserve this, so how am I suffering the way that I am? It's got to be due to God at some level, which in fact it is. What do I think? How do I respond? What do I, what do, I do? Well, I can argue my case with God. That's what I can do, but how do you argue your case against God? God is creator. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is creator of, of all that is. How do, how do I, who can't even see God, how do I question God about how God is, is treating me? And beyond that, um, if God pulls a God thing on me and starts asking me questions, how on earth am I going to respond to God? I mean, God can ask questions I can't even begin to answer. And I know that. 
So how do I how do I really enter into a conversation with God where where it's at least fair at some level or another? Um, God's just too mighty and too cunning to be able to try to to meet God in in any way that makes real sense. Uh, so even if I could take God to court over the way that He has treated me. God's likely to twist that argument in a way that no matter what, I'm going to turn out to be the guilty party. And that's not fair either. It just simply is not fair. Well, okay, he's got a bit of a point here because injustices in this world tend to impact the innocent a lot, don't they? And, and he's innocent. <laughs> he's impacted. Uh, so how do we get a, how do we with any kind of real sense of integrity, how do we stand there and tell people that God protects the innocent, looks after the widows and the orphans, when it's the widows and the orphans that are suffering so greatly everywhere you look? That's the basis of this, this deep, unsettling question that Job's having to deal with. You've got an answer for that. I'm not even sure. I don't know that you do. I don't know that I have one. And he certainly doesn't have one either. But the final uh, verses of chapter 9, um, he talks about his, his inability to demonstrate how innocent he really is. Life is just too short. It's just passing so fast that I don't know how I'd even have a chance to, to talk to God about this. But I certainly know, Bill Dad, that just blotting out all the negative and thinking happy thoughts isn't going to solve much of anything in my life. So I've, I've heard enough out of you. And even if I could find the, the roughest, toughest borax soap to try to clean myself up, the way God's been treating me, he's probably just going to pick me right up and throw me right down in a big mud puddle and make me way worse than I was to start with. So I'm just kind of doomed right at this point. Um, God would disgrace me worse than I am even this very moment. If I could just have an arbiter to help me work my case with God, there might be some hope. But there is no such thing. Well, again, we're centuries before Jesus. So he doesn't have the ability to be able to rely on a mediator who, who speaks on our behalf uh, as Jesus does. There's just no one to help me here. And so he begins once again to, to look at. If anything, God needs to declare what the charges are against me, Job. It's not fair to do these things without letting me know what it is that I have done. And if you truly are God, then you should know that I am innocent. But the very fact that you are treating me this way makes me question whether you truly are God, or at least whether we truly understand what we have thought we knew about you. I mean, God, God made Job, for heaven's sake. God should then know Job through and through. And since God does not punish the righteous, what's up? Why is this happening? There was, there was a time when God used to look after Job. Watch over Job. But that time is obviously no more based on his situation uh, right now. Were all those previous times when God treated him well just, just pretense on, on God's part? Uh, if there was more to it, then what's going on now? Uh, God seems pretty intent on breaking Job, and in fact, he's pretty much broken already at this point, literally as well as emotionally and, and spiritually, but for whatever crazy reason, God isn't letting up. He just keeps piling it on to Job. Then there are some portions of, like in the Testament of Job, that, that um, pseudepigraphic text that I mentioned uh, three weeks ago, it even goes so far as to say that Job was 47 years out on that donkey. It seems a little long to me, but, but maybe he was. Uh, but at any rate, God just keeps piling it on uh, to Job. If God would just cease and desist, though, he'd just stop. 
Job could enjoy one last brief moment before he died. And that one last brief moment of happiness before he died would give him a chance to exhale, to say, okay, would he be happy to go ahead and die? But God doesn't seem to be willing to give him that brief respite for all of his pain. Bildad's response uh, is a study of contrasts. Uh, it seems at once shockingly blunt and insensitive, uh, since having to choose between God's guilt and Job's guilt, well, there's really no choice to make. God cannot be guilty, as Ron alluded to. Yet Bildad is also full of genuine uh, encouragement and hope for Job, uh, suggesting just if he truly is righteous, his future will be filled with joy and he will be vindicated. As expected, there's also the ever reoccurring refrain uh, from the friends that the way of the wicked is doomed. And instead of going back through some of the, the points Vaughn made, let's just, I'm going to just jump straight to chapter 9 and offer just a little bit different perspective. Uh, when we enter chapter 9, Job's second rebuttal, we see what represents uh, what you know, we could call vintage Job uh, in the worst and the best ways. And it's worse, not only does God, or does, does he, sarcastically deconstruct the words of his friends, uh, in this case Bildad, but also, if you've noticed uh, referring back to the words of Eliphaz as well, he also launches what would be considered his most direct attack uh, on God thus far throughout the book. Uh, but at his best he still feels that just given a fair trial, uh, he could win his case. Uh, unfortunately, he thinks that despite his innocence, God will still find fault with him. Uh, leaving, leaving him only to wonder uh, why the one who formed him would want to destroy him and ends his speech on a note of despair. And one thing I kind of want to allude to, uh, and Vaughn kind of hit on it, is he, he keeps making these allusions uh, to a mediator. If, if God was just a person, he, if, he could, if he could just uh, you know, almost have a savior. And, uh, you know, again, it's funny. I'm going to quote, this is the second time I've quoted uh, J. Vernon McGee. And it's interesting, I don't normally, you know, quote J. Vernon McGee, uh, but the more I was, you know, just studying for the book of Job, I was looking at, you know, different textualists, you know, they can be a little dry, uh, different theologians, and, you know, I just happened to, I had a commentary, so I picked it up, and I was like, well, let's see what J. Vernon McGee says. And it was just very informal, and I think that it actually read just much more digestible. Uh, and, and again, one thing that I'll, uh, Quick quiz since we didn't have one today. Uh, exegete versus eisegete. Uh, again, keep in mind, hopefully we're pulling out of the text, not putting in, of course. And that would be a good example would be, is there suffering, you know, anguish in the book of Job? Yeah, that, that's that's exegesis. That's that's letting the text speak for itself. You know, eisegesis would be, yeah, what Job's talking about right here is 2021 COVID. Okay, well, that's, you're reading a little into it there. So hopefully we're doing this all from an exegete standpoint. But with that being said, uh, McGee, I thought, I thought I kind of hit it on the head here. Uh, I'll do it again without the accent. Job is saying, in effect, if God were a man, I could talk to him. This is the reason why God became a man, my friend. Remember, I always added my friend at the end of everything. So man could talk to him and walk with him and realize that he cannot meet God's standards. The only man who ever met God's standard was the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was a man, I can go to him. He died on the cross for me, and he shows me by his life that I cannot meet God's standards, but that I need a Savior. That is what poor old Job was longing for. And to that I say, And the last of the friends then is so far, the Naama. Well, Naama is the fourth great granddaughter of Cain, <laughs> way back in chapter four. And so she, the thought is that she settled uh, somewhere on the border of where Beirut and Damascus is today, or somewhere out in the middle of the Euphrates River. And since 
He is a Naamathite. It's just plain as day that that's where the connection is here. It could be uh, somewhere on the Syrian Iraqi border. Could not be. We don't we know. Don't. More importantly, is what uh, Zophar will, will say. And he just jumps right in. God punishes evildoers. And using a little bit of logic here, the understanding is you, Job, are an evildoer, therefore God is punishing you. Simple as can be. When he begins to accuse Job in those opening verses, he effectively is saying, Job, you've gone to blithering. You're just mouthing nonsense. Stop it. You need to be quiet. Your claims that you are making about yourself, they are spurious, and you know it. So quit trying to convince us that you are, in fact, blameless. With that uh, stated, he then begins to talk about God's wisdom. Um, so far, like Job, wishes God would speak. Because if God would speak, then Job would get his comeuppance pretty quickly. So exactly the opposite of what Job is thinking. Uh, it, would, it would point out immediately how far off base Job has begun. Well, you know that if you start playing around with stuff, your mind begins to drift that direction and things that, that once upon a time might have really shocked you become acceptable and then become okay, and then become normal. And that's what he's suggesting here that Job has done. He's gravitated into areas that he shouldn't have, and he's become so comfortable with them that he no longer recognizes how inappropriate they are. Well, there's nothing, of course, in the text to say that, but that's what Zophar's accusation is at this point. He marvels that, that Job has the audacity to actually challenge God's justice. How can you even think about doing something like that? God has obviously detected your deep secret faults, Job, and that's why he has punished you accordingly. Well, he knows something that the narrator didn't know, and he knows something God didn't know. Uh, but that's something that we tend to do ourselves, isn't it? Our enemies, our opponents, we eventually start dredging up dirt on them. We start imposing upon them beliefs or notions or ideas or things that they have done that justifies why we treat them the way that we treat them. Well, that seems to be okay. We just don't like it when they do the same thing to us. But, but that's what's going on. Zophar thinks he knows how wrong Job is, and thus, he starts reading in all the inappropriate things that, that Job has done. On the other hand, contrary to Zophar, who's wise enough to have figured all this out, Job is completely incapable of understanding God's wisdom like he, Zophar, does. If he, if he would, if he could, he wouldn't be in the situation that he is in. Like the other two men, two men then, he uh, calls for Job to repent. You just need to repent. You need to come clean about all the secret ways you've been gaining wealth through extortion. Really? There's nothing in the text to describe that at all, but that's where he's at. If you will do that, then all of your fears will dissipate. Your present troubles will soon be forgotten. Your life will again be secure and good and hope and peace and comfort will return to you, Job. But if you choose not to repent, there's absolutely nothing good to look forward to. Eliphaz spoke on the basis of inspiration. Um, Bildad spoke on the basis of the traditions of the elders preceding us. So far, speaks on the basis of a particular doctrine that is the only doctrine that matters to you. God is just. And from the basis of that, he spends all kinds of other details that makes all of life fit that one doctrine that he holds to be sacrosanct, which usually makes everything wrong if you do something like that. And certainly it's that way for, for Zophar. 
Job's response to Zophar, he begins to complain uh, very vividly about what his friends have done. And he has two main complaints uh, against his friends. The first is, and he picks up this line from them, um, they don't know nearly as much about Job as they think they do. And he's right. They don't. Um, despite living uprightly, in the opening chapters, we're told that, that uh, Job, like Noah, is a friend of God. High praise. Um, instead of recognizing that, um, they just see him as a contemptuous sin. An incredibly wicked man. Even though they've known him for apparently a very long time, they look at what's happened to him and they assume he's got to be this terrible, terrible sinner. So instead of being compassionate, they've now become caustic. Um, but you know, if they would just, if they just shut their mouths long enough and open up their eyes and look around, they'd be able to know that evil tends to strike all kinds of people at inappropriate times. It's not just evil people in this world that get hurt that suffer and struggle. Everybody does. Nature could teach them some things if they just pay attention. His words fall on deaf ears, incidentally, but that's, that's his first complaint. Then there's this wonderful interlude, several verses long, in which he waxes eloquently about God's sovereignty. It doesn't seem to fit here, but, but that's what he does. Um, God is responsible for all that happens. He not be. God made everything, and God is all wise, and God is all powerful, and God can totally destroy, and God can totally control. He can make anything. He can unmake anything that, that God desires. It's a wonderful, uh, eloquent statement in these verses. And then he enters the second complaint against his friends. Not only do you not know what you think you know about me, but Contrary to what you have said, I am every bit as wise as you Yehus are. I know some things, and you should start listening to me. And by golly, I am going to argue my case against God after all. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to argue my case uh, against God. Um, if nothing else, those so-called friends have revealed that they're really just mental cowards. They're humiliating him to hold on to the pious truths that they have, rather than recognizing that they may just not understand things quite as well as they think they do. <clears throat> really, they would be a lot wiser, they would at least appear a lot wiser if they just shut up, if they quit talking. And even though it hadn't yet been written or spoken, the, uh, the maxim about, you know, better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and, and remove all doubt, that's exactly what Job is saying here at this particular point in time against his, his friends. And all those proverbs they've been quoting at him, they're totally worthless and, and they're nothing more than bumper sticker truths which in them of themselves are proof that they don't know anything, but they keep pulling them out and telling him about them, and he's really sick and tired of it, and they just need to, to back off. Now, granted, he doesn't know how he's going to do this with God. He doesn't know how he's going to have a chance to, to argue his case against God, but you know what? If he could just obtain an audience with God, even if God made an utter fool of him, just obtaining the audience would be proof that he was, in fact, blameless. Because God wouldn't have an audience with him if he weren't. God doesn't listen to the, to the unrighteous. Well, okay, we may have some struggles with that, but, but that's his thought here. And insofar as that's his thought, he's, he's right about that. <clears throat> and so, so reflecting on that, he begins to think, well, how am I going to pull this off? How am I going to pull off this audience with God and argue my case with God um, in which God will ultimately vindicate him, or so he hopes. And that's what happens between about the middle of chapter 13 to the end of, of chapter 14. And he, he's thinking that he needs to probably set some ground rules for this particular trial that's going to take place. Um, you know, if the trial's going to be fair, first of all, God needs to stop afflicting him. You know, 
know, I mean, it's hard enough if you've got a bad headache, a migraine, or if your stomach is, you know, twisting and turning on you, it's hard to teach kids in school or do whatever it is that we do, have any kind of serious conversations if you're hurting. And his hurting is way beyond anything like that. So God just needs to stop afflicting. That's, that's point number one. And then point number two, God needs to mask his glory. Because God being God, if God shows up in the midst of the trial, we're all going to just, you know, our mouths are going to go agape and we're going to fall down on the ground and start worshiping. So it's not fair for God to show up in all of God's glory in this trial, not being godlike. So God needs to not do that. And if, if those two points can be met, then Job has a chance at pulling this off. Now, he doesn't care. If God wants to be the plaintiff, that's fine. If God wants... Job to be the plaintiff, that's fine. We'll do it either way. And, and God can choose which it's going to be. He just assumes that he's going to have to be, Job is going to have to be uh, the plaintiff uh, in this particular trial. And so that's what the assumption is down in verse 23 and, and forward. Uh, and if he is going to be the plaintiff, then there are three more things that, that he needs. First of all, he needs God to come clean and tell him what are the sins he has committed that were so terrible? Because he had enough. And if he's, you know, God lets him know, well, then he has, you know, he can say, okay, I'm sorry and I'll repent. But he needs to know, because otherwise he's just having to guess. And then secondly, he wants to know why God has abandoned him. Because as far as he knows, he's not done anything. Why did you abandon me? And then third, why are you treating me so unjustly? You know, maybe I did do something, but surely I didn't do anything this bad to deserve all this. So why are you treating me like this? And talks then as well about God's surveillance of him, just leaving him frazzled. As unimportant as we human beings are, not lasting any longer than we do, why are you spending so much time on him? Well, I get that, you know. Fruit flies that last 17 hours, I'm really not going to study for very long. Uh, why on earth God takes as much time with us, you know, especially somebody who's evil? Who knows? That's, that's Job's point here. Lay off me. Give me a chance here. Besides, if you don't, you're going to kill me. And then what have you got? We used to be your friend. We talked. We shared. We laughed. Spent time together. You kill me. I ain't gonna be there when you come looking for me later. So you gotta stop. And that gets us to the last little bit. You know, if you cut down a tree, if it didn't get it dead on you, if you cut down a tree, there's a good chance that a sprig's gonna come back up. It's gonna have if we think simplistically here, it's going to have a second one. Cut that down and it might even have a third one. A human being ain't done anything. You're dead. You're dead. You don't come back. you got to lay off God. Because if you don't, I'm right there. I'm right at the point of entering Sheol anyway. And he doesn't, again, he doesn't know that God has said he ain't going to die. As far as he knows, he is dying and dying quickly. <clears throat> Death puts an end to all things human. There's just no awareness of anything. And if God doesn't stop, give him a chance to pursue this trial, then he's going to be in shield. And God will no longer have access to him. That's the end of round one. We could all use more friends like Zophar, couldn't we? <laughs> Zophar, the, the legalist. Uh, again, just to build on kind of what Mark said, he assumed that God was according to measure, according to law, uh, and he continues to pretend throughout the dialogue 
that he knows exactly what God would do in any given circumstance. Uh, he's different from Bildad, if, we, if you kind of start noticing just the little, little nuances between them. Uh, Bildad, I guess you'd probably call him more of a traditionalist. Uh, Bildad said you can go look to the past and learn, uh, whereas so far much more of the scientist type where, uh, you know, unlike, you know, and also compare that to uh, Eliphaz, uh, who did allude to mystical experience, so far does not at all. And nor does he appeal to the traditions of the fathers. Instead, he uses a type of, I guess you'd call it like a reasoned theology. Uh, and time constraints kind of prevent me from adding much to what Bond's already said. But by the end of chapter 11, Zophar does conclude by saying to Job, again, you're, co you're going to come to the time when the judgment of God will be upon you unless you confess your secret sin. He predicts the absolute, complete judgment of Job, then, and that concludes Zophar's address, which in reality is just a constant attack upon Job. All three friends have now had their little say, and Job's response will be one of the uh, lengthiest discourses uh, in the book. And again, Job begins his response by stating, like Vaughn alluded to, there's nothing Zophar has said that's new or unknown. Uh, in fact, even nature testifies to the sovereign rule of God, which Job then uh, satirically characterizes by emphasizing God's unaccountable, often destructive rule over the world. Uh, and again, just to add a little bit of color commentating here, if you look at uh, verse 9 and 10, Job asks, which among all created beings doesn't know that the hand of Yahweh? has done this. Uh, and again, this seems to be a direct quotation from Isaiah 41, 20, and significantly containing the only use of the divine name uh, throughout the poetic chapters uh, of the book 3 through 37, uh, before Yahweh speaks himself, beginning in chapter 38. Uh, again, just food for thought, how should this be explained? Uh, it could be uh, an error of a later scribe. Uh, who had Isaiah 41, 20 in mind, incorrectly inserting it into Job's letter. Uh, also, it could be an unconscious error by the author himself, quoting directly from Isaiah, but failing to remove the, uh, the Hebrew transliteration. Or, it could be quite intentional. Again, this would be the position I lean towards, uh, given my uh, views on divine inspiration. As if the author is kind of giving us a clear wink. You know, in saying, yes, I'm quoting from the Tanakh, uh, even though in Job's day, if you take my view, it wouldn't have been written there. Uh, once we get to chapter 13, uh, we'll just skip to verse 28. And he, for his part, wears out like the cave, like a moth-eaten garment. Again, Job's faith is the fate of all humanity, as Vaughn alluded. His pain, the pain of all sufferers, hence the sudden shift of his own circumstance to he. Without explanation who of this he is. Uh, again, modern versions uh, of scripture will begin the verse with man, which anticipates that 14.1, basically the rendering losses, uh, kind of, it loses some of the force. And uh, despite the awkward transition, uh, I think the, the spirit of the King James Version is actually preferable here. And he, meaning of a human being, as a rotten thing consumeth, as a garment that is moth eaten. So what's funny, by chapter 14, Job does not rebut his friends uh, here at all. Instead, he describes the sorry state of humanity, destined to live their futile lives before passing into oblivion. A tree has more hope than a person, since a tree could be cut down and live again, in contrast with the fate of humans. Job can only wish that God would hide him in the grave until his anger passes by and that their relationship would be restored, but alas, it is only a wish. The chapter reads, reads much like Ecclesiastes, and there's always hope, and next week we'll start to see, the next few weeks we'll start to see this rebuild. All right, you've got the basics down at this point. Uh, these friends are going to be coming at Job, basically saying, you're a sinner, stop. Job will be gradually becoming more belligerent himself 
against the friends, starting off talking to the specific person who just spoke, branching out to all three friends, and then eventually turning to talk to God to try to say, why are you doing this? There we are for the next two weeks. Thank you.